welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're on a long range rifle course with bangs, bucks, and bullseyes. <laughs> now I'm going beyond the sea wall, wildfowling on the Tor Estuary in Devon. The best wildfowling starts like this. We're out in the freezing hours before dawn near Barnstable on the Tor Estuary. Local intelligence suggests that the cold weather has driven huge packs of duck up the estuary. We're hopeful that it will be a red letter morning. We are tight up against the water's edge, hiding under the lip of the salt marsh, and we quickly know we're in for a good shoot. We've been hearing the wing beats up and down the river for half an hour in the black. With the first glimmer of light, we get the chance of our first shots, and duck start coming down. As dawn breaks, the wind drops and we stick out like sore thumbs. Time to move from the waterside to two hides that James builds when he first arrives. We're on the Tor Estuary, which is part of the Tor and Torridge Wildfowling Association. And uh, we've, we've had a cracking flight this morning. We've had five ducks each and uh, they've the decoyed very nicely. Can you, you just explain to the viewers what that rattling noise is in the background? Yeah, that rattling noise would be uh, my old dog here, Reese. It's pr about more minus one degrees today, so it's, uh, it's plenty nippy enough. People say they shiver through excitement, but no, he's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And what sort, of, uh, what sort of duck do you go to? I, on, on our day, we can get a lot of different types of duck here. I mean, this morning we've seen mallard, widgeon, teal. Uh, I did see a pintail at first light. Uh, occasionally we get the odd gadwall, but predominantly it's mallard, widgeon and teal. Well, we've got seven miles of estuary. Uh, it's standing from Barnstable way up to our, to our east. Uh, we're going all the way down to, to Applebore to our west. Um, you've got some of the biggest tidal ranges. It's part of the Bristol Channel. So you've got, you've got to know your stuff when you're coming out here. But if you make the effort, you've got some fantastic shooting available. Well, on, on arriving, you want to scan the, the, the tide line and make sure that you know how high the last tide came, so you know roughly where to set up your decoys. Um, we set up better part of 20 duck decoys, built ourselves two hides, so we can shoot quite nicely. And uh, yeah, we, we did not bad. And there's geese here as well. Yeah, on a, on a day there can be up to a thousand geese here, but you've got seven miles of estuary; they can go wherever they want. Uh, and today, unfortunately, they weren't up there. <laughs> Well, we've had Jamie up at the other end, haven't we? He's fired a few shots. I spoke to him on the phone. He managed to shoot himself a couple of duck this morning, uh, but I've heard him fire a few more, so you never know. He might have got a goose. You don't know. He, he had goose decoys out, didn't he? Yeah, he had a rake of goose decoys out there. He took better part of 40 goose decoys up there, and uh, it's possible to have some superb shooting if they play ball, but that's wildfowling. The Tor and Torridge Wildfowling Club was formed in 1975. Um, I've been a member myself since the, the early 90s, so I'm shooting here from six years old. Um, a fantastic club to be part of. I mean, there's duck buzzing around in the background at the moment. I'll just, I'll just I'll up if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic club. I mean, it's a little bit shy on membership at the moment, which I find really bizarre because you've got some superb shooting available. Uh, it, at the cost of £95, you can join the club and that includes your BASE membership. There is a short pause in the shooting at dawn, which gives other wildfowlers time to set out their decoys further down the bank. Then the ducks start flying again. One of the joys of wildfowling is that there is plenty of non-shootable bird life to watch from the hide. There are oyster catchers, shell duck, skeins of Brent geese, as well as less welcome birds. In the hide with James today is Geoffrey Olstead, the editor of the Basque magazine Shooting and Conservation. I mean, if I lived within an hour or two's drive of here, the first thing I'd do is get my name down for this club because the sport's terrific. Well, I'm here as a guest, um, really to get some experience of seeing this. Um, I've never shot down here before. My wild family's been up in the north. Um, and this is fabulous. I mean, I, I just... We've seen so many duck this morning, and you know we've shot a few. But you're also here to write a piece for the mag, aren't you? Well, that's true. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this is work for me. You see, just <laughs> terribly hard work. It's been such a problem. I mean, not many people have to get up at four in the morning and come off into the freezing cold just for the job. <laughs> 
didn't know what to expect, to be honest. Um, I mean, up where we are at Basque, we've got the DSG, which is a, a vast expanse of mud and chemical factories and pretty disgusting, really. Um, but over on the Welsh coast, West Wales, you've got estuaries quite similar to this, which are relatively clean mud, um, a nice river. And so it's not entirely different from the Dacini um, or the Dovey estuary, something like that. Um, but I really didn't expect to see quite so many birds. I mean, I think it's exceptional, the amount that we saw today. I mean, OK, James was great at calling them in, and I was rubbish at seeing them, because in the half-light, my eyes weren't working at all well. The last shot of the day is superbly dramatic. James takes a quick widgeon that falls out on the fast-flowing water. His dog, Reese goes to fetch it. It's the toughest swim of the day for Reese, but he powers on out to the duck. Then, holding it in his mouth, swims strongly back towards his master. What a perfect way to finish. Well, we got ourselves a hen mallard. That's that one there, that was a lovely shot at first light. Oh, and there's a cracking cock widgeon. And we've got a few hen birds here as well. Yes, yeah, so we, we're not, not a bad spoil for a morning. Nobody likes a greedy wildfowler, so after taking enough duck to cook, we pack up and head for home. Taking down the hides and winding in the decoys is always something of a race as the tide starts to come in. It's only a neap tide, but Geoffrey relearns the motto, less haste, more speed, when he falls in and gets a cold soaking. The camera catches him just as he's hauled himself up. Have you got plenty of spare clothes when you get back to the car? Yeah. We're soon on our way home. There's just one more job to do before we leave the marsh. Reese's much loved predecessor, Kai, is buried out here. His grave often underwater at high tide and marked by a single post. James always makes sure he pats the post for luck and to pay his respects on his way past. You wouldn't go home with many wildfowl without a good dog. Nearly at the cars, we meet up with another Basque officer, Jamie Stewart, who runs the West Country region with help from James and others. He explains the full extent of the shooting here. Of course, we arrived here, the, the, the estuary was, was mud flats, uh, and you can see behind me here, you can see uh, Chivermere Base right down to Appledore in the distance, a good seven miles of estuary from Barnstable down, uh, and a great, you know, a wonderful place to come and shoot, uh, particularly Widgeon. A good number of teal on the marsh this morning, and I have to say that uh, for four shots I had two teal, so I uh, two wedging rather. So I, I was uh, fairly fortunate this morning. It's wonderful value, and you compare it to, to a driven pheasant shoot. You, you will come on here today. We, we certainly wouldn't shoot as many cartridges off at the birds, uh, but we have more challenging shots, different angles, birds surprising from over your shoulder, coming driven towards you. You will probably fire off half a dozen, fifteen shots maximum, uh, and you'll get. A, a, a nice variety of ducks, wedging, teal, and if you're really lucky, you know, Canada geese. It has been a truly exceptional day. If you want to know more about the Tor and Torridge Wildfowling Club, visit www.ttwc.org.uk. While the snow plays havoc with the roads and rails, it was also making life a struggle for our wildlife. With the pressure on, it's the ideal time to call in and control hungry foxes. Their usual prey is enjoying the extra layer of concealment. So as the stomachs start to rumble, a well-delivered call becomes even more attractive. Roy is hoping for a good day, and the signs are encouraging. There are definitely foxes about. You look here, he's gone under the shed, so he might even be under here. We don't have the benefit of white camo, so Roy opts for the rifle and puts himself back on a bank, giving him a wide arc of opportunity, including a clear view of the shed to the right, farmland to the front and woodland to the left. Once the call has defrosted, Roy gives it about two minutes of calling and then, hey presto!
Just before the fox turns and runs, having spotted the unnatural blot on the landscape, Roy puts him down with a 120-yard headshot. Excellent. Young dog fox there. So uh, they do look lovely when they're in their, uh, their full winter coat, don't they? Absolutely superb. But I don't think we had a lot, uh, a lot longer left. Unfortunately, where we were sitting out, the, uh, we really did uh, stand out like pimples on a backside up there. So, uh, yeah, he, he definitely made us another few seconds and he would have been on his way. But at least the cameraman finally got one on, the, on, on film, a daytime fox. <laughs> right, let's see if we can go and find a few more. Thanks to the snow, we can forensically analyse the scene. So this is the track that he came up here. There's a big, big stand of brambles just in the middle of this wood here. So he was obviously just, uh, just tucked in there. And just before, just before um, we noticed him emerging from the wood, did you hear the magpies calling? So he, he, he'd started to move, all the magpies started to cack up. So it's always a good indicator that, uh, that something's about to happen. If, if the crows start going or the blackbirds start going or the magpies start going, then you know there's something moving about in there. It's an excellent start and we're off to the next location. A fruit farm which hasn't had fox control for two years. The snow again reveals the toings and froings of the local wildlife. Again, the signs are good. Roy selects areas which are on the margins of woodland with plenty of bramble cover. Both the rifle and shotgun are to hand in our first position. Unfortunately, it doesn't deliver any foxes. We move on through another orchard and there are signs the wildlife is feeling the cold. Rabbits have started gnawing on the exposed twigs. The conditions are also playing havoc with the kit. Scopes suffer from whiteout and barrels get clogged. What I've got to do is just clear out the, there's a little bit of compacted ice just in between the barrel and the stock. So I need to clear that out so it doesn't affect the harmonics of the rifle because something like that could put the, uh, the bullet off just enough to miss. So you want to make sure that you don't get any uh, compacted snow or ice anywhere down interfering with the rifle. Once again, Roy chooses an elevated position. We know there is movement as the magpies start making a racket, but hunger doesn't inspire this particular fox to break cover. Every time we set up in another location, there's that great feeling of anticipation, and there is a good feeling about this little clearing. A fox does appear, but in true panto season style, it's behind you. That's just typical. We were just tucked in, just over there, just through the entrance of that gate, squeaking over there. And you've got tracks running in. Fox has obviously come in here, stood, seen us just through there, and then run off back the same way. So you always need eyes in the back of your head for this game. The tracks in the snow show just how painfully close this fox came, and we wonder how often this happens, but we never know about it. The day hasn't been as successful as we'd hoped, but the fox is a it's cunning not. predator, which is why hunting Charlie is such great fun. At least we had uh, we had one good response. Um, there was a couple of other times I'm sure the foxes were coming through, and uh, you could hear the magpies going and the, the blackbirds going in the in the thick bush, and uh, they didn't uh, just didn't want to emerge out and come across the, the little open patches. But you know, I think uh, a couple more days of this, and we might be in luck a little bit more. But Obviously, I mean, we want to leave that, that patch now for a few weeks, let them all settle down, and uh, then hopefully go back there. But we'll try a, a few different areas. It's useful having those the trails, isn't it, just to see who's about. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, seeing, seeing that uh, that fox, you know, came up behind us and was, uh, was obviously standing there looking at us, it, uh, it tells the tale that, you, you know, you wouldn't, otherwise you wouldn't know. Um, but it's, with the, with the snow, obviously, one, uh, the foxes are going to have to be a lot more active because they're going to have to be out there searching for food. Food's not as readily available. Um, so, you know, you've got, to, you've got more of a window when they're active um, to try and get on top of them. The other thing, obviously, is that uh, with the snow, it makes it a lot easier to see them. So when they're emerging, then obviously it's uh, when you're looking across a field, you can pick them up a lot quicker. We've also been lucky enough to spend a day enjoying the extreme winter conditions while trying to cope with the challenges it presents us and our quarry. Okay, so in this shot what we're just going to use is 
something that we'd find natural in the field. I've stalked it around the edge. There's a row over there, steel target, white row, but a row nonetheless, life size. This tree's here, it's not moving, it's very stable, so it's even more stable than sticks. So what we try to do is incorporate that into our shot. Now, obviously, I'm gonna use the tree to take the weight of the rifle and provide stability at the front. So my rear leg is the one that's up, not my front leg. My rear leg is the one that's up to stop the pivot around the front point that's anchored to the tree. I don't want my rifle against the tree because hard to hard will set a vibration in the rifle at shot that could well knock the shot off target. What I want to do is use the tree along with my hand to support the rifle and take a shot at 300 yards on that row deer. Weight's on my rear foot, so I'm comfortable not shaking, and my rear arm is supported to take the pivot out. I'm using the tree because it's here and it's stable, and I'm as low as I possibly can get. A prone shot's not possible because of the grass. So there we are. I've found my target. I've got time. She doesn't know I'm here, and I'm about to take my shot. And I'm going for a heart-lung shot, standard classic shot, which leaves me more room for a tiny bit of variance if it does happen. And there she is, there's down. So again, using natural aids, I've stalked along. There's a roe deer 300 yards away, I'm not advocating that, but if it was a wounded animal that I was following up, natural aid again, fence post. A, it's a tiny bit of cover. It's rock solid, it's not moving, so I should use that. The barbed wire moves, so I don't use that. I'm onto my target. I've got my hand between the rifle and the fence post because I don't want that vibration. It's rock solid. I've dropped down a little bit, which isn't a natural shooting position. Foundations of breathing and everything else apply exactly the same way, same routine. And you can hear the ding, and the deer's down. Now with the gate, the gate's very solid, and it's got various heights that you're able to shoot at. Now, we talked about kneeling before. I'm sitting on my foot, I haven't got any tension in my front leg, and I'm using my rear leg to lock down that pivot and keep my rear arm stable. So, 300 yard row deer, I've walked, I've seen it. I'm using a gate for support, I've got my hand underneath the rifle so I haven't got vibration with a hard surface to a hard surface. And it's foundation is apply of breathing, trigger can, and follow through. Picking up the animal in my scope. Heart and lung, animals down. Since starting Field Sports Channel, we've been lucky enough to go out with some exceptional stalkers and film some incredible deer. We've chosen the best of the bunch and are releasing our first deer stalking DVD just in time for Christmas. A year of deer, 12 months, 6 species. It's stuffed with great advice and great stories. There's the fallow stalk with the added excitement of an aggressive dog walker throwing abuse as we take out an injured buck. Rugby league legend Kieran Cunningham describes his first red as being better than scoring at Wembley, and he should know. There's also a masterclass in calling in those roebucks and grallocking a Chinese water deer. It amounts to more than an hour and a half of some of the best action in the field, and for just £12.99. Go to the new shop page on the front of the www.fieldsportschannel.tv website to order in time for Christmas. Also in the shop, you'll find our collaboration with sporting shooter editor James Marchington. In Pigeons, the Expert's Way, we talk you through hide building, decoys with Andy Pye, and see how to prepare that huge bag of birds with game chef Mark Gilchrist. This is now available at a reduced price of just £12.99, including postage and packing down from £17.95. Finally, we can announce the release of Foxing with Robert Bucknell and James Marchington. In this new DVD, Robert well. gives us a fascinating insight <laughs> yes. into an animal he's dedicated his life to understanding, enjoying and controlling. From calls to lamps, rifles, shotguns and ammo, an incredible range in mid-Wales where we test ourselves and our equipment and going out after this most 
cunning of quarry. It's 90 minutes of tips, techniques and action in daylight and at night for just £19.95. Available from our online shop and from www.sportingshooter.co.uk.